Ladies turtleneck season, it is November, amen. Amen, you guys. Well, uh, uh, we're excited to get into the Bible this morning. And uh, we're continuing the Mark series. Coming around the bend here. Uh, we got a few more weeks. But uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12 this morning. And uh, we're going to be talking about love for God. All right, guys, we're going to get a little participation. Yeah, wh- how, do we, how do you show love for God? What are some ways we can show love for God? Let's get obedience, singing, helping people, praying, sharing your faith. Let's get one more, Jeff. What was that? Oh, show love. Absolutely. Hey, hey, all of those fit into what we're going to talk about this morning. Amen. Mark chapter 12. And we're actually going to begin... In the middle of the chapter, verse 28. Now, this is a time when uh, Jesus' ministry was growing in an incredible way. And uh, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, are starting to get filled with the jealousy. And so they're trying to find ways to trip him up. And we pick it up here in verse 28. He says, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, Of all the commandments... Which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one. There is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from that time on, no one dared ask him any more questions. You know, I know a lot of times growing up, going to church, not even for myself, studying the Bible, getting baptized, it, you start to get into the Bible, it can seem a little bit overwhelming. In everything you, you can read and everything Jesus calls us to and everything you read in the Old Testament. Yet God consolidates it right here. He says, hey, all it takes is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. He says, you've just got to be all in in your relationship with God. The rest will figure itself out. And this morning, we're going to go through each one of these elements to hopefully challenge and inspire your faith. As we get a deeper understanding of what love for God truly looks like. That's why the title of the lesson this morning is, Love for God is This. Love for God is This. We're just going to go for it through each one of these, one point each. Point number one, all of your heart. All of your heart. Mark chapter 12, verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. shamefully. He sent still another And that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat. Others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What what then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants And give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him. Because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him and went away. You know, all of your heart. There's a powerful passage here and it's the, the parable of the tenants. Now, it's an important element. When, when you're breaking down a parable, we've we got to identify the different characters. 
You know, it begins talking about the only owner of the vineyards that represents God. And it says he prepared the vineyard. He, he made it awesome, and then he hands it over to some renters. Who did those renters represent? It was the leaders of Israel. He hands them to the renters, and he says, hey, the, all of that I ask for is some of the harvest, is some of the fruit. And he said, and when, when he comes back, he just wants to share in that, yet the owner of the vineyard sent servant after servant as God sent prophet after prophet after prophet. And the renters did, did not just send the servants away, but they got angry and, and beat and then eventually killed some of the servants representing the leaders of Israel getting angry at the prophets of God, eventually leading to the killing of his own, God's one and only son, Jesus Christ. Now we have to ask ourselves, why would men who obviously, not talking about the leaders of Israel, why would men who obviously believe in God get so far out there spiritually where they begin hating the very things of God to the point of, Killing the Son of God. How do you go from, man, you're, you're studying the, the scriptures, you're reading the scriptures, you get to such a deep and dark place that you begin hating God and hating the things of God. Well, let's turn here to Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, verse... 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You know, here Jesus lays out very clearly you can only have one master. Now, what was the issue with, with the teachers of the law and the Pharisees? It wasn't that they didn't have any reverence for, for God, it was that they had divided their hearts. They divided their hearts, and, and though it started, it may have started off with just a love and a passion for God and his word, eventually that drifted, and they started to love their position. They started to love their careers and their status, and over time that grew into a hatred for God. And you may think, I, and I see they did that, I, I could never do that. Well, it's easier than you think for that to happen in your life. You know, you look throughout the whole Bible, you'll, you'll find people who just give Satan a, a little sliver of their hearts, and Satan uses that to pull them completely into the darkness. One such, such example is Judas Iscariot. Check this out in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 1 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who, was, who would later betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. You know, here we see that, that Judas, this is one of Jesus' 12 closest friends. This is somebody who Jesus had given power to, to drive out demons and to heal the sick. And man, Jesus loved this guy. He had invested in this guy. And here we see that, that Judas, it says from the beginning of his time in the ministry with Jesus, it says he would help himself to the money in the back. Now, I, I believe that I'm sure that Judas had a good reason at first to take some of the money. In his eyes, I'm sure he had some noble reasons. That maybe, maybe one month it was, it was his mom was short on rent, so he took a little bit out of the money to, to help out his mom. And then maybe his brother was having some medical issues. So he's like, hey, let me just take a little money. And so he took a little here, he took a little there, but he never confessed it. 
He never got open. He just gave Satan a little bit of his heart, eventually escalating to what we see in Matthew chapter 26. Let's turn there. Matthew 26, 14 says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then, then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Jump down to chapter 27, verse 1. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans of how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. You know, here we see that that Judas innocently just gave Satan a little bit of his heart, and that led to the crucifixion of Jesus and his own suicide. You know, the biggest issue in Christianity isn't that we don't want to follow God. It's that we attempt to follow God and something else. I don't believe that even throughout the whole world, I don't think it's that people just genuinely, like deep down have a hatred for God. I believe that there's something inside everybody that desires that relationship with God, but we also desire something else. And it can, it can feel so innocent. Say, like, oh, you know, in the morning, it's like, you know, I should go to God, but I'm just going to take a day for myself. You know, just, just take a day off. Or maybe it's like, you know what, I, I'm going to, Richard did a great, great job about, Given our contribution, like, you know, I, I want to give to God. I want to help, but I'm kind of in a tight spot right now, so I'm going to hold back the money this week. But next week, and all it starts is a sliver of giving Satan our hearts. And before we know it, we're hating God through the way we live. We have to ask ourselves, does God have all of your hearts? Can you genuinely say, man, God, God has all of my heart. If he doesn't have it, amen, you got to make a decision to repent and give him your whole heart. And we have to understand is that it's not always just the super satanic sinful things in our life that are vying for our attention and for the number one spots. Right? What could it be? I mean, our, our family, our wives, our, 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 our jobs, school, our finances, things that are inherently not evil. But when the, you start to get so focused on that and you start to neglect God, then it becomes a problem. You know, I think, again, we have to understand is that it's not just the, the, the impurity or, or the lust or the drunkenness that's going to take down your relationship with God. You think about it in a race, the number one challenger and the number one threat when you're running a race, it, when you're in first place, isn't the guy in fifth place, it's the guy in second place. And I think we can get so focused on the fifth place and fourth place things in our life, I mean, the purity and this and the worldly relationships And we're not realizing that God's starting to lose control and lose the number one spot. And now school's actually the number one spot. Our family's at the number one spot. And deep down in our heart, we actually start to despise the things of God. But when we truly seek God and his kingdom with all of our heart, the rest will fall into place. Amen? All of your heart. Point number two, all of your soul. All of your soul. Let's go back to Mark chapter 12. In verse 38. Let's hear Mark 12, verse 38. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. You know, during Jesus' ministry, he taught to all types of religious people. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, Herodians, and all different people with all different types of beliefs, but all these men had something in common is that they claimed to be men of God. And yet, their behaviors all demonstrated one common thing, is that they were quite the opposite. They were not true 
men of God. It says they had a deep desire for respect, the most important seeds. It says they devoured widows' houses. You ever think, what what does he mean by that? Well, it was after husbands would would pass away and they would pass on the the houses to their their wives. Um, The the teacher of the law would exploit the widows, con them out of their homes with large taxes and fees and kick, kick them out onto the streets. Yet they knew the word of God. And so we, we see that, that even though they knew the word of God, but their, their behavior wasn't reflecting that, we see there wasn't a doctrinal issue. It was a behavioral issue. And I think somebody says, you yeah, know, I, I believe this is God's word. Absolutely. That's, sometimes that, that's not the issue. It's not, okay, we believe the right doctrine. Amen. But it sometimes it can be a behavioral issue. Now, how big is that a behavioral issue? Well, the behavioral issues got the Jewish leaders who eventually have Jesus nailed to a cross even though that they believed the word of God, right? And what was the issue is that they they loved power more than they loved God. Power in itself isn't bad. The love of power is. And power is one of three major things that reveal our true colors in this life. Power is one. It doesn't really change you. It shows who you really are. Money. Money something. It doesn't really change you. It exposes. You're able to finally, when you get money, you're able to express who you truly are. And the third is hardship. You know, people say, man, I, I'm struggling so much because this hardship came into my life. No, 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 no. The hardship is exposing what's truly in your heart. And it brings to the surface to show you and those in your life what your true character really is. Now, when we're talking about loving God with all of our soul, We're talking about desiring God. I love Psalm chapter 42, where it writes, As the the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Right? Anybody grow up with dogs? Right? It's like, man, after you you take your dog out for a, and they just come up, they're panting, they they see the water bowl, they run up to it. It just just sounds so refreshing as they just gulp down the water. It's like, man, it's like, that's got to be us in our pursuit of God. The man, you, you wake up in the morning, you, you see that water bowl, your Bible sitting there on the kitchen table. Hey man, I got to get into that thing. But we, we, we have to have that, that spiritual desire because as crazy as it may sound, even more than water, we need God. You know, it goes on and he, he talks about, uh, 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 there's there an article I read. It talked about the love of money, hardship, or the, the money, power, and hardship can expose your your heart now, but it also goes into that there's four things in life that we can truly desire and love. One is to be rich, a desire to be rich. Now, money isn't bad. The love of money is. First Timothy 6.10 it says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The second is pleasure. We can have a deep desire and love for pleasure. Proverbs 21 verse 17 says, Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. And anybody who's really pursued pleasure, it takes up a lot of your money. Number three, self. The third thing we can love and desire is self. That doesn't just mean, hey, man, I I want a $100,000 car, and I want to go to vacation to to Rome, or I want to go. But love for self, sometimes we can be deceived. See, man, somebody's doing something. they're, They're helping out the poor or Man, they're going out, and they're doing this, and they're, they're doing good things in the community. Yet that still comes back to a love for self. How, how so? Well, it, it shows that you love your own self's plan more than God's. Right? Because there's so many non-religious people. It's like, man, well, they're a good person. They do this, they do this, they do this. But if it's at the expense of not pursuing God, that is a worship of self. And the number four thing we can love and desire is God. And I, this is something that we have to focus on. That there's so many things vying for control of our hearts and our minds. You wake up, man. The, the, the world, more than ever, there's so more distractions today in 2023 than there have ever been in the history of the world. There, there, there's so many distractions. You could have a great heart, and I, I believe that most of us have been there. You have a great heart, man. I, I, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to go pray. And then, and you, but you see your phone. Or I'm going to go read my Bible. You see your phone. It's, you got a text. Oh, and then. Oh, and then you, you see, and, and oh, you got a, there's a, oh, that, there was a trade that happened, and this is for me, I'm a sports guy. Oh, oh okay, and then I get a, then I get a text, and then I'll oh, check an email. Where was that charge from? Did it? 
And before you know it, an hour and a half has gone by. You've been given zero of your morning to God. There's so many distractions. We have to make a decision that we're going to love the Lord our God with all of our soul. That begins by giving our mornings to God. Amen? Point number three, all of your minds. All of your mind. Mark chapter 12, verse 13. It says here in Mark chapter 12, verse 13. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Mic drop right there. Boom. He says, and they were amazed at him. Continues, it says, then the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies... And leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no children. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the women died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Right, they're just trying to do whatever they generate these crazy stories just to do whatever they can to twist Jesus up a kind of a a spoiler alert they never get to him they never twist him up Jesus replied verse 24 are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures of the power of God when the dead rise they will neither marry nor be given in marriage they will be like the angels in heaven now about the dead rising have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush How God said to them, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. You know, you know, here they they come to Jesus, and man, they're 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 trying to really puff him up here. They're man, you're 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 a man who teaches in accordance with the truth. You're not swayed by people's opinions, and then they kind of come in and try try to twist him up a little bit. And they're trying to make, man, can we get out of paying taxes? And and what, what what does that look like? And uh, uh, what's so interesting, they have a back and forth. And then, and then the Sadducees come in. And these, these are, again, extremely religious people. So Jesus is talking to, the, to all these, these Pharisees, Herodians, Sadducees, all these people who had, knew the Bible better than me and you. Right? They, they had the scripture. They had this stuff memorized. Like you could be, they could just re- recite you the book of Genesis. I don't think any of you guys can do that. Not yet. Maybe next first principles next year. I don't know. But man, these guys, these guys knew the scriptures so well. Yet what was so interesting is in 24, Jesus replied to them, are you not an heir because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? So how is it that men who spent their whole lives studying the scriptures didn't actually understand them? Because that's what Jesus says. He says you're an heir because you do not understand the scriptures. What we see here, objectively from the passage, is that you can study the Bible every day your whole life and not understand it. How can you get to this point where, well, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9, it reads, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. 
you know, here it says, man, how, how can you study the scriptures your whole life but still not understand them? It's when you refuse to love the truth. You know, the reality is, is that many, many, many people read the Bible, but they, they don't read the Bible from a perspective of, man, what's God want me to do? They, they, they gum it through a lens and through a filter, not trying to get out what God says, but trying to fit and justify their way of life. Man, what, what, what can I read? Okay, I, I think I can align this with kind of what I believe. And, and we, 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 we gum, come through the scriptures from a lens of, not, man, what is God trying to, me get, trying to get me to do? But from a heart of, man, why, how can I justify what I want to do today or what I want to do with my life? It's so interesting. I've had the privilege of studying the Bible with hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of men. And it's so interesting that, you know, you, you get into a Bible study. It's like, man, I, I want to seek God with all my heart. Okay, you want to do it? Okay, this says, yeah, I want to do it. And then you, you, you get into the word of God. Hey, you want to make the Bible your standard? Yes, I want to make the Bible my standard. And then you get to discipleship where it says, hey, Jesus says you got to surrender everything you have in your heart to be a true disciple. And you got to deny yourself every day and give every day to him. Then it, it somehow becomes a little fuzzy. Wait a minute. Are you, are you sure? What and, and, then, and, then people, and then people will come up with the excuse like, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, do, I mean, yeah, Jesus was alive, but is this like, do we know this is like really God's words? I don't know. I've started, I've, honestly, I haven't, I didn't tell you in the first perspective, but I've been questioning. Is it, you know, it's like, <laughs> people start to question. It's like, no, no, no. You, you just don't want to repent. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened with, with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians is, it wasn't that they couldn't understand. They didn't want to understand. And in the same way, in the 21st century, we have to make a decision to love the truth more than our, ourselves and more than our own comforts. Yeah. That goes, man, when we're studying the Bible, before you become a disciple, but even after you've made Jesus Lord and been baptized, that we can fall into this as well. We've got to repent and obey the scriptures. Amen? Amen. You know, I think that's one of the issues where we see in Christianity. We see all these churches around. And it's so interesting because it's a bit of a, a placebo Christianity where, man, you, you go to church, you, you start to change your life a little bit, and things may get a little better. You know, and, man, there's people, man, I, I'm going to this church and that church. And man, things are getting a little better. But why it's so sad is that people change a little. Their life gets a little better. And they like, man, this is, this is it. This is Christianity. I, I've, you know, I've been graduated from high school now for, what, 11 years ago. And uh, uh, through those 11 years, it's so interesting on Facebook. I know you kids don't know what Facebook is, but um, for the adults here. Um, it's so interesting. So, you know, I, I'm friends with all these friends I went to high school with. It, and it's so interesting because I've been a disciple now for seven and a half years. Praise God. And, uh, but it's so interesting that over those seven and a half years as a disciple, I've seen so many friends Come into, come to, into Christianity, man, they've gotten baptized, or man, they start going to church, they start posting scriptures and this and that. And after a few months, or after a, a year or two, they drift back into their old way of life. And it's so sad because in just the religious world, people get a little bit of a hint, man, they read the, the scriptures, they, they sort of sense the power of God, but because they don't fully repent, get baptized as true disciples, they don't experience the ultimate power of God. And because of that, the atheism is on the rise, agnosticism is on the rise, not because there's any lack of evidence or any lack of truth in the scripture, but because people see such a, a lukewarm, fake Christianity that, that isn't sustaining power in people's lives. That's why it's so important for us as disciples to continue to love God with all of our minds so that we can transform people's understanding of true Christianity. Amen? Amen. Point number four, all of your strength. All of your strength. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offering was put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in a large amount. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, 
But she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. You know, what's so interesting here is that one of the, the keynote passages of giving to God and, and of giving back to God and contribution and sacrifice is demonstrated by a woman who just gave a couple copper coins. And we see an incredible passage here, an incredible, an incredible teaching that, you know, God's not looking for that, that dollar amount in your bank account to give every Sunday. That, that, that's not what God's like. God's not looking for, man, you, you, it's like, man he does, he's like, man, God, I want to baptize four people every month, and then I know you'll love me. No, no, no. God just wants to give you to give him all of your strength. Whatever that may be, you don't have to look to your life and be like, dude, he can do more than me. He can do God doesn't, he doesn't judge your relationship with him off of what the people to your left and right are doing. He's asking you, man, are you going to give me all of your strength? And you know, what's so, what's so funny here is here that this, this older woman gives a couple of copper coins. Imagine being, what if there's a guy next to her who gave like, man, almost all that he had and more than her. And man, he was giving and because he loved God, and, and because, but it was going to put his family in a tough situation. He's like, man, I, I think God is going to bless this, but he doesn't get recognized. Right? There's people in the church, I can guarantee you, who gave and really gave with, with, with a good heart, but God, Jesus didn't call them out. You may think, well, dude, Jesus, that's not fair. I gave a lot, too. I, I, I gave from my heart, too. Here's the thing. Life isn't fair. Let's turn, let's turn to a scripture where, where God says life is fair. Just kidding. It's not in the Bible. Um, you know, growing up, my dad always told me there's three fairs in this world, the county fair, the state fair, and the world fair. Outside of that, nothing's fair. And growing up playing sports, you realize, you feel like, man, I, I'm better than him. Why aren't I start? This is so stupid. This is, so, I, I'm better. I, dude, this is just, oh my gosh. Like, man, when I get out, when I, when I get to high school, man, things are going to change. Man, things are going to get fair. When I get to college, man, when I get done with sports, things are going to change. Things are going to be fair. Man, when I get my first job, man, things are going to change. Things are going to be, you're, I, hopefully you don't have to live 80 years to realize that things are never going to be fair. But that's okay. God just wants you to make a decision. Hey, give all of your heart and love him with all of your strength, whatever that may be. Amen? Amen. You know, we've got to give God all of our strength. Uh, But not only that, we have to understand and break down what love for God truly is. What is it? It's to give God all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And it's incredible that we have one who's given God his all as Benjamin has come to be baptized. Let's go ahead and have the brothers up here to introduce him. Amen.